Rob Hutchinson. Uh, his practice is in, in Seattle. Uh, most of you have already looked his information on his website because we shared we shared we shared you guys some of his work so you can uh, get to know him a little better. Uh, it's a researcher and an educator, and 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 his interest, uh, what I understand, overlaps in the fields of architecture, arts, and photography. He uh, has a master's degree from the University of Washington. I, it was interesting to me that you have a BS degree in structural engineering and architectural engineering, which I found very interesting because then, and then also you are very interested in the arts and photography. So it's very complete, all of your baggage of knowledge of, for, to be able to, to create these beautiful buildings. Uh, you have won the Rome Prize in architecture Emerging Voices, lots of creative uh, artist fellowship uh, by the Japan U U.S. Friendship Commission, which also I, I, I was looking at your work and saw uh, very interesting things, connections with the culture, Japan's culture, and, that, and now I wonder why when I <laughs> saw this. And, and also uh, on your Memory Houses project, uh, you got this a interesting idea about talking about a memory of an, an, an mortality. A, about the, the first thing that catches my attention was that uh, the story that you talk about your father losing his memory and you trying to, to understand uh, what's the connection between memory and our buildings and, and architecture. Uh, being said that memory is a, is a faculty of the brain by which data or information is enclosed, stored, and retrieved when needed. Uh, if we say that architecture, it's a built object that, that overpasses time and creates certain effect on people that lives and enjoy that space, it creates memories. It creates memories on those people. So... Uh -huh. So the, the, the architecture will be the memory imprinted in one person's person's brain, and it will be it will, it will change the definition from one individual to another. Uh, that's one thing that that I'm I'm putting on the table. Uh, so architecture will be different for everybody, and and my question is, will it have a expiration date? Like because it's something that it's imprinted in your brain. Uh, but it's also a physical building that will be a, that will be will be lived by different people, different brains. So can you can you? I'd like to open that conversation with you into mortality, memory. I know we, you haven't shown the project here. Well, we might show we might see something of that work from you, but just start by that topic, please. So you start off with the hard one, the hard one. You don't even you don't even <laughs> start with the easy one. <laughs> it was straight to memory and mortality. <laughs> no, it's very interesting because I, because to me it, it was very difficult to try to to understand what to how to open the conversation, See. and it, and it's very intriguing to me to know what you think about. No, I, I appreciate you bringing that project up. I, I do. If I have time, I hope to show that at the end, um, because it's an important project to, to me personally, but also it's an interesting project related to my practice because it started as a very personal thing, as you mentioned, out of my father. Mm -hmm. But what I realized is that I was designing buildings that, that related to my memories, to my childhood, and that I would start seeing architectures in the very things that we were designing. And, and that became interesting, I think, for myself personally, but also as a discussion with my staff. Mm -hmm. um, it, again, the project's very difficult to talk about in some ways because it started out as a personal one. Mm -hmm. But um, what was interesting is that it became a, it became a, something that we were working on in the office together. And it's interesting because that project, people really gravitate to the personal connection of it. That's what people really connect to, I think. But for me, it's, it became, it, of course, it always has that origin, 
-hmm. but it actually became more about process and talking about how we how do we design and how do we know when the things are that that influenced us show up in our work and I'm just interested I'm very interested in that I will say that again if I have time after the memory houses that project has now we're sort of finished that project it, we did an exhibition in Casa Belagan um, last year mm -hmm. and we published a book uh, pertaining to that project and now we're starting to work on a project that relates to memory also but it's re it's now relating to collective memory and to communities that have uh, sp just specifically Japanese communities that um, uh, were destroyed by the tsunami uh, in 2011. But starting to talk about, and the, the office hasn't been working on this yet because we're, we're still just starting to just do research. But I'm very interested in talking about how that topic of memory relates to communities and how how it might even relate to the, the design of a future community, particularly communities in Washington State that are are uh, that have never experienced a tsunami, but will are supposed to experience one in the next two hundred years of the same magnitude as in Japan. Mm -hmm. So there's sort of this interesting past, present, future thing that's starting to be something that we're exploring in this new project. Another question I have into that topic, it's, it's not a topic, it's more on, on the way your, your office works. It, it started as a personal project and how do you manage to co convert it into a, an off, uh, everybody get excited about, because it's very personal what you were just started doing. So how, how does it happen? Like, because you have your your work, everyday work that you do for, for a living and then you start doing this and it's a, it's a very interesting project because there's lots of work involved on it. And, how do you manage to, to do that thing? For me, it's very interesting because I never had time to do, uh, to start thinking, uh, and I know you're very busy. How do you do it? Well, I don't know if I always do it so, <laughs> um, successfully in any way. I mean, if I had my choice, we would be working on all of it as a staff. We would all be working on it more. Uh, the so far, the, the difficulty is allowing that to happen. Um, what, it, what it meant in that particular project is that, particularly in the beginnings uh, and the development of the eight buildings, we had a lot of meetings, uh, like always including the staff in discussions about the project, which became quite interesting. And, and I will say, I think influences our built work and how we work in the office even down to the renderings and how we talk about what we're trying to do in the presentation of these uh, visualizations of buildings that will never be built. And, and the discussion of trying to create an image that seems like it's real, but clearly it's not. Is there's, there, there were a lot of themes that started coming out of these conversations that we would have. Typically conversations at the end of the day over a lot of beer, a lot of wine, <laughs> um, but definitely always try to in include the, the staff mm -hmm. in that conversation, but inevitably to get the work done and to develop the work, it means that usually there's one person that's working more on that with me mm -hmm. financially. Inevitably, I can't have all the, all the, all the office working on, on, no, it just doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, even then it's, uh, financially, it's not, it's not a good business model. I don't recommend it mm -hmm. uh, as a business model, but it, it definitely. It complements, no? It complements. It definitely comes. Yeah. 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 Okay. So do you have some work to show? <laughs> I do. Okay. Uh, so uh, I really appreciated yesterday's talk by, is it Cade and uh, Jesus? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I was very jealous of these beautiful, <laughs> like in Landscape. the landscapes that yeah, I really wish that we had. Mm -hmm. I don't have those to show. So um, uh, mine will be, my presentation will be a little bit more focused on the specific buildings themselves maybe. Mm -hmm. what, what I thought I'd do is um, just have fun with this and do three different presentations. Mm -hmm. We'll start with a video, a very short video that um, explains our office. 
uh, or it's a portrait of our office uh, done by uh, our, our good friend Juan Benavides, a uh, really amazing young architect out of Mexico. Uh, and then I'll talk about uh, maybe four or five of our buildings and then uh, two installation projects. Installations are very important to us. And then end on um, a Pecha Kucha presentation of the Memory Houses project, if we have time. Great. Let's, let's so start. I'm going to start with a video. Uh, Jorge and I tried this video out last night, and it worked out generally OK. It's not an ideal resolution to make it work for everyone, but hopefully it'll give people an idea of our office. So. My name is Robert Hutchison. I live with my wife and children in a 1912 farmhouse in the Fremont neighborhood of Seattle. Over 10 years ago, I designed and built a small studio for my architecture firm in the backyard behind our house. The building can reverse into the backyard, which is why we call the building the Pop Out Studio. is only 430 square feet, it's able to provide flexible working spaces for myself and my five employees. The steel ship's ladder provides efficient access to the loft level. is very simple. Walls are wood studs clad with drywall to provide ample daylight throughout. The exposed wood roof framing provides a touch of warmth to the otherwise white interior. A custom bookshelf on the first floor provides storage for our many models and gives additional working space for model making. Outside, the building is covered in cedar siding stained white. Both levels are filled with art and architecture books, and each level has a conference table so we can have two meetings happening at once. Even though we're in the center of Seattle, because the studio is surrounded by vegetation, it feels remote. The roof deck is a perfect place to meet with a client or for the studio to gather over drinks at the end of the day. So hopefully that song will remain in everyone's head for the rest of the day. Already. <laughs> um, 
that again, that video was done by Juan Benavides, who's I'm, I'm not sure if he's on uh, the, the chat today, but he's done a number of videos for us. And um, maybe that's a, in the Q&A, we can talk a little bit more about the importance of the co collaboration to our office. So just sort of working with people. Um, I mean, he's an architect himself, so we've collaborated with him on conceptual projects, but it's just been really fun mm -hmm. um, doing a, uh, a series of videos with him and, and talking about what that means conceptually to our practice. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, as you saw, it's a tiny, tiny office. It's only 40 square meters, but we have typically four to six of us in, in the studio. Um, obviously, right now, <laughs> it's just me. Mm -hmm. uh, which uh, Jorge and I were talking about this yesterday. Like, I think depending on the office, this this condition is manifests itself in different ways. Um, for us, it's not ideal at all. Uh, we do a lot of physical models, uh, and and just sort of physically being present together is important. Mm -hmm. So we've been. I mean, we've we've figured out how to work. Obviously, you have to, and it's working well. But it's. If you had to ask me, it's not my preference at all. I really miss having people in the studio. And so we're looking forward to trying to get back to normal, normalcy, hopefully soon. Mm -hmm. But let me, um, you know, even though we're a tiny office, I, I'd like to think we've had a, we have a pretty diverse body of work, but mm -hmm. what I thought I would show is, let me see if I can share my screen again. Am I sharing my screen right now? Yeah, no, no, it's not sharing. So I'm gonna, I'll do a sort of more conventional slideshow here of a number of um, projects. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm hopefully can keep this to 45 minutes total. That's what we talked about, or maybe close to 40. Um, let me start my stopwatch. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm just going to get into it. I uh, thought I'd talk about. Um, a few built works that we've uh, done over the years and uh, really sort of trying to maybe talk about strategies that um, I think maybe after practicing for 20 years now, I've seen are, are either reoccurring things or, or things that we've realized are things that are of interest to us, which I think is always a difficult place to be when you're a design firm, particularly just because in our profession as a service-based condition, we're we're always up against things like codes and budgets and client requirements. And to really sort of look at your work and try to figure out what the hell you're actually trying to do is, I think, the hardest thing in some ways. So this is sort of what we see um, or what we've talked about uh, is happening. This I'd like to show this first project. Um, this is actually a project that I did in collaboration with my previous partner, Tom Mall. Um, this project dates back about 15 years ago. It was completed in 2007, but it was, for me, it was a pretty defining project uh, because it, I started realizing some of the things that I, I was interested in as an architect. Uh, you know, this is a project that we completed uh, construction five years after I had been working for a really great firm in Seattle, Miller Hall Partnership. Um, uh, I had been there for seven years, and, and so it's interesting to start your own practice and to incorporate what you learned at with under previous people, but also try to figure out what, again, you're trying to do. This is actually an unusual project for us in the sense that this is a very large, um, while still budget conscious, it's an expensive house. It's on a very, very difficult site. Um, the site is very steep. Uh, it's on a waterfront uh, on an island near Seattle. Um, the width of the site is about 15 meters. Uh, and the length of the site is about 120 meters. So um, that's a large site in some ways, but for our client who had a program of 700 square meters, very quickly because of the zoning requirements and the height requirements, there's always a question of, well, how do you, how do you bring all this stuff into this site? It's actually two buildings. There's a lake house uh, down at the bottom, which I'm not gonna talk about. Uh, and then the main house, which I think is the more interesting one. And, and I'm actually gonna just present this pretty quickly here. Um, the challenge again was how do we get all this, all these requirements of the brief 
onto this site, particularly with a narrow site, a steep site, and a site that had a very uh, strict height, height requirement. And the, the solution, which became quite interesting relative to later work, is to carve away into the site uh, with a, a subterranean uh, courtyard space and to place all of the main living spaces on this lower level with the obvious idea of giving a, a view out towards the beautiful view of the mountains and the lake. But we were actually much more interested in this moment right here, this little, this, this introverted private courtyard. And what you're not seeing in the site plan is there's a house right here and there's a house right here. So it's, it's actually, it's not urban, but it's, it's suburban and your neighbors are right next to you. So we, these are a very, these are models that I made in the span of one day, um, where this is the first model I made that was sort of this idea in my head and starting to explore a carved condition with a retaining wall and how the main space of the living spaces could go through this building and relate to that back space. And what's interesting is in one day, what you're really seeing right here is basically the final formal resolution of this project, where we have a south facing courtyard space that's sunken down below grade. Uh, the bedrooms are in the upper level, the main living spaces are at, are at the middle and then other ancillary spaces are in the basement level. And what that challenge, but also became an opportunity for was if you're gonna put your living spaces down on the second floor, the, main, the, the middle level of a super steep site, how do you get people in through the front door? And what we, and this is where precedents become um, important. And by the way, this is basically the final scheme that you're seeing. Um, this is a plan in section, but I'm gonna to go to a precedent real quick. Precedents are always important to us, meaning like work that has been done in the past, the memories that we have of our own experiences of architecture. This is Gunnar Osplund's incredible library in Stockholm that I saw when I was a student uh, and experienced. And it's, this is not the best image to show, but if you know this building, the whole idea is that he brings people in at a lower level into, and then brings them up a stair into the middle of a cylindrical drum. So he, when you arrive in the center of this library, you're in the exact middle of all of these books. And that as an experience sort of resided with both Tom and I, he, he had also studied in Scandinavia. And that idea was realized in the building itself where we thought, what if instead of trying to bring a front door in at the upper level and figure out how to get people down in the middle portion of the, of the house, what if we created this experience of stairs and bridges and crossing over water, going downstairs and bring people into the middle of the house, uh, still have them outside in this glass enclosed box and then open up the door to come into the main level. And I think that that idea of um, both, well, what I was gonna say is this idea of carving away and using the form of the building to create exterior space between the building and the landscape is a common theme that keeps reoccurring in a lot of our work, but also this idea of really thinking about how you get into the building and what the experience, the narrative of, of traveling through the building is something that we talk about a lot as well, even on the super tiny projects that we have. So really quickly, because I don't want to dwell on this project too much, uh, uh, this is standing from one of the bedrooms looking across that courtyard space where you can see this sort of prolonged experience of walking through these different spaces, coming across a bridge and then coming down the stair, still being outside. So this is that courtyard space. Grade is right here. So, you know, we have like 15 foot retaining walls really sort of cutting down into the property and then still being outside right here, but now you're in the center of the house, uh, treating this all as glass so that we can look from the living, the main living space all the way to the back courtyard space. And this is the, the front door. And then another thing that just was maybe instilled more in at, with me working at Miller Hall, the, the importance of the wall section uh, and the building section, but the detailed building section 
being able to really start thinking at a detail level of, of this, but how all of these things relate to the greater whole is something that's reoccurring in all of our projects. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's the place in drawing where we're, where we're most excited at understanding how everything's coming together. Another project at the opposite end of the scale, perhaps, is this tiny house. Uh, you know, the previous house was 700 square meters. This is 80 square meters. Uh, this is next door to my, to my studio, um, uh, directly next door, it's 10 feet away. And this, um, this is almost, um, I'm not sure how to, it's, it's almost diff, very different from the previous one in the sense that it's this very taut building. Um, I like showing this not very good photograph from a drone uh, for one, because it shows the relationship of the building. It, it was still under construction here uh, to um, my studio right here. And there I am and there's Sean. Um, but what, what be became really interesting in this project was to work with a very, very, very simple envelope, like a very simple form, but explore how the interior could be really pushed to an extreme uh, with the intent of creating very interesting and diverse spaces uh, in what is otherwise ex an extremely small building, uh, again, 80 square meters. Regarding precedent, this is one that keeps coming up in our work constantly. Um, this is Sakamoto's, um, uh, the, the Japanese architect Sakamoto, whose work we look at a lot. Um, and I've always appreciated his work because he deals with almost a somewhat simpler, simple, funky exterior vernacular. But then on the interior, he's always pushing and pulling things. He's really thinking about how spaces relate to other spaces, how, how spaces can reside within a larger space. Um, and so this idea of, of understanding the whole space from the inside, but also creating spaces within that is, is a theme that I think is reoccurring and is very strong in this specific project uh, next door. The, these are final renderings that we did uh, that sort of show the, the, princ the principle of this uh, scheme. Uh, and then these are some of the models that explored a lot of the different formal conditions that we're looking at. And generally we settled on this one and this one, a simple version of this one. Um, but the important thing, oops, sorry, is that what we became interested in was treating the entire interior of the exterior portion of the building as drywall, painting it white, and then setting up a rule set that everything inside of that exterior, the interior of that exterior shell would be treated as plywood. So treated as like a piece of furniture. And then we started even talking about this piece of furniture. And of course there's walls and bookshelves and guardrails and kitchen stuff inside of this, uh, even bathrooms, but cladding everything in drywall. And then we started talking about it as a tree where it has like a more solid trunk. And then as it, as it climbs up, it branches out. The, the floors are treated similarly to, to the plywood. Uh, and then the walls themselves start to feather out and become lighter. But the idea that you can, you're always thinking of this as one large space, even though the plywood um, enclosures are creating spaces within that. The other really important thing is this double height space that if we did, had not done this, this project would be deadly. And the reason being that the floor to see it to underside a ceiling is only 2.1 meters. So the challenge with this kind of project, and we're doing a number of these backyard uh, houses, it's a new typology in Seattle. And the challenge is that the, the height limit is super, super strict. So we're within half of an inch of, of our height requirements here. And so the only way we can make this work is by making a very, very thin floor assembly, but also really pushing that first floor uh, down to code, which is basically seven feet for us but then giving some relief with a double height space. The other thing that's, that we spent a lot of time on, um, which everyone should spend a lot of time on, are floor plans and really thinking about an efficient floor plan. Um, 
I really love this project because uh, the, the secret to this project was the location of the stair. And again, we're doing more of these right now for, for another client. And it's all about the stair. Where is the stair in this scheme? It's not all about the stair, but in this case, with a square layout, what we're able to do is set up a pinwheel condition and bring in a central entry and you arrive at the bottom of the stair landing and you have four choices. You can go left into the kitchen, you can go right into a double height uh, den area, you can go up the stairs to the bathroom and bedroom, or you can turn around and go back outside. Uh, and then on the second floor, when you arrive up in the middle of the house, similar to the first project I showed, at that point, you can step up into the bedroom, you step up into an office that looks down into the double height space, or you step up into the bathroom, or you turn around and go back downstairs. So it's all about like really trying to work through this uh, plan layout to, to create as efficient a, a condition of a, as possible. And then these are just photographs of the finished product or close to finished. Um, uh, another thing that we spent a lot of time on is apertures and really thinking about not just the composition of openings in the facade, but, but perhaps even more importantly, the relationship of those openings to the spaces inside. I really like also the element of surprise. And in this case, you don't know that this is a double height space. We never give you that condition in the facade itself. Uh, in this case, it was more interesting to us to stretch the, the bedroom window over into the stair area, down into the entry, and then across uh, on the lower portion of the double height space, and then push a window in the upper part of this double height space up to the ceiling to draw morning light in. And then these are just shots on the interior. Um, showing this plywood tree uh, and then, you know, just things that other people do well as well. Um, opening up our stairs so you can see through when you arrive um, in the, at this entry. Looking here, you look right up into the bathroom when the doors open. Uh, here's the double height space on the right and then moving left uh, into the kitchen. But there is this sort of continuous space that sort of pervades all the way through this building with, that we think is really quite, quite nice. Is looking at the back side of the stair from the living dining space uh, back towards the double height space here. Also just things like this, again, the ceiling is 2.1 meters. So really pushing using the aperture to your greatest advantage. And, and even though it's a super low ceiling, if you can do a floor to ceiling height aperture, then it, even though it's low, it feels, you, you end up being able to see that line of that plane go out to the exterior, which completely changes the way you feel inside the space. And then this is upstairs from the bathroom. This is that steel stair landing that you step up into the three spaces and from the bedroom. Again, that's the, uh, the large window that then gives you a view from the from the loft. And of course our wall sections. I mean, this project uh, in some ways is a, sort of a mix of the last two projects I showed in a sort of interesting way. This is a um, project up in the mountains uh, near Mount Rainier, our, our big volcano. Um, the site plan shows uh, its relationship it, to the, um, this is the White River that drains from one of the main glaciers um, uh, that comes off of the mountain. Uh, and the site has all these beautiful trees. Um, what was interesting on this project was that, and this is maybe another thing that we're always interested in trying to bring into our, our projects, uh, 
similar to maybe the first one, this idea of an exterior space that's part of the house. Uh, whenever we can, we try to incorporate that. So the idea of a courtyard. On this project, what was interesting is our client actually came to the table with the idea of a courtyard. And the early uh, schemes that we looked at was a courtyard that was open to the entry. So using that courtyard as an entry sequence. And in fact, all four of these, you can see, again, we had maybe 15 schemes that we looked at. It was always a generally a U-shaped condition where we would have a bedroom, um, garage, bedroom, and then living dining space with a, a bedroom, a main bedroom here. The general floor plan changed or stayed the same all the way through. Uh, the other thing that stayed the same again was this idea of an outdoor courtyard space, which you see in all the schemes. And then another thing that was very interesting to us is this idea of a light monitor, but not so much to bring light in, but rather as a view uh, looking up into the trees. I've always been a huge fan of uh, Smilian uh, Raddick's uh, Copper House. I mean, I love his work across the board, but this project is something I've always been really intrigued by. It also, th these photos don't show, but it actually has a really sweet little courtyard space in it. Um, obviously a very different climate, not very different, but a different condition, a different site. Um, even the way he is elevating his building is different than what we uh, ended up doing. But really looking at this as a source of inspiration turned into a consistent interest in bringing a monitor into this scheme, uh, particularly in these three. And then the final scheme is this one, uh, where the monitor ended up becoming in incorporated into the roof shape itself rather than being a very overt thing. But again, the floor plan, quite simple. Um, an entry courtyard space with a U-shaped condition uh, with living dining spaces, an outdoor covered patio, patio that shares space with the monitor that's above it. So the monitor brings light in from the south into this space and also gives views from this space up into the trees. Uh, and then an office that you walk through to get to a guest bedroom and then the, the main bedroom tucked in at the north end of the house. And then this is a actually more a utility room for his, uh, our clients are really active skiers and by, uh, mountain bikers. So they use this as a, as a work room for, for that, for, for those to, to maintain their equipment. Ended up becoming just a very simple low building. I really like how um, it wasn't necessarily intentional to, to try to make this building disappear, but it really does sort of recede into the landscape quite nicely. But th this is what I, I think my favorite part of this is that once we started settling on this scheme, which had more of a north-south orientation, uh, the building was, became much more sort of low and more linear than the earlier schemes that were more square in plan. It became important to us uh, that we start containing this courtyard because the proportions of this courtyard, uh, the courtyard became more about just a, a, having a relationship to this space. You know, this is a solid wall. This of course has a window, but the relationship became more sort of east-west relationship in the scheme versus a, well, I would argue sort of an equal three-sided condition. And because the proportions started changing, it started feeling less like a courtyard when we had it all open. And so we started enclosing it and then we realized it was quite nice to start completing the form of the building. And this was a contention, an issue of contention with our clients. We, this took us, I forget, I know Scott's on here and maybe he could pipe in, but I can't remember. But it took us several weeks to convince our client that this was a good place to go. And even going into construction, he wasn't convinced. Uh, but once we got it built, they, they love this, uh, this condition. And for us, it, it just became really important to define this courtyard space as a moment that's in between the forest and the interior of the house, uh, not just formally, but spatially as well. So these are just some other photographs. This is looking at the south facade with the exterior covered patio that also serves to, to bring light into 
the main living space as well as give views up through to the trees. And then another thing that I think we're pretty good at uh, after learning over the years is spending time on things that matter most because we, we do tend to typically have relatively budget projects. I mean, again, they're custom houses. So it's, we're not talking about social housing here, of course, but we do have tight construction budgets typically. And so we have to be very careful to, to lead our clients into places where we can, can really spend our money where it matters and to let other things, not let other things go, but, but know where, where we should be putting our, our time and our energy and, and specifically our clients' money. So in this case, really thinking long and hard about how we can get a lot of glass uh, at the living room level to, try, to, to tie into a double height space condition that then wraps and becomes integral with uh, obviously a more expensive build out of steel for, for this fireplace mass and then letting other simple things like drywall just be um, that more background. I was just talking with one of my staff last night and this building does have sort of an interesting quality of being two-faced. Um, and actually you could say it's three-faced because it has, has this, this, it has three very primary facades and every person in the office has a favorite. Um, I'm, not, I'm just gonna stop there. But uh, this is the view from the, uh, from the, uh, the river looking back towards the house. And then a building section, wall section cut through the courtyard itself. And where you really understand that this is, again, this is, this is completely unnecessary from a structural point of view, from, from any point of view except an architectural point, point of view. But for us, this is such an important element to this house. Last two projects that I'll talk about are both in Mexico. Um, I'm not sure if Javier's on. Uh, I know he was going to try to be on, but uh, very uh, humbled and to, to have worked on both of these uh, in collaboration with uh, one of my best friends, Javier Sanchez. I know Jorge is also good friends with him. Um, and as you probably, most people in the audience know, Javier's a really great architect working out of Mexico City. Uh, he and I have known each other since I believe 2006 and have collaborated on a number of things together. Most notably before this, uh, did a lot of teaching uh, together. Uh, I've been teaching a Mexico program since 2010 uh, at Casa uh, Bergan uh, in Mexico City. Um, so Mexico has actually become sort of my second home as much as I can make it. Uh, and so having the opportunity to build there is just a, sort of a dream come true. Um, this is a, maybe about three years ago, Javier and his wife had purchased uh, land uh, in a small town called Timascautepec. Um, and this is maybe half of an hour south of Valle de Bravo, um, sort of near uh, the Toluca volcano, uh, about two hours west of Mexico City. And they wanted a retreat. They wanted to build a small house. Um, and then the, as we started working together, the program increased to include a bathhouse as well as a studio for Javier. And uh, Javier was actually teaching in Seattle at the time uh, when after he had purchased this and he asked if I would be interested in designing this with him. And of course I was completely honored and flattered and and said, of course, let's, let's do something. And so we actually started designing this in my studio right behind me here at my table. Um, and it was a really amazing, true, truly collaborative process, uh, starting out with him uh, and I uh, sketching together and then having both of our offices work on this. Um, this is a construction photograph taken um, probably six months, well, maybe eight months ago. Uh, and it shows the, the, the 
cabin, if you will, or the house uh, under construction. And really quite simple project um, conceptually. It's, it's a steel colonnade that supports a wood roof. Um, very simple, single story platform uh, with these skylights that erupt up out of the roof to bring light down into the interior spaces. Um, this is a photograph looking uh, east towards the volcano in the morning. Uh, so Mexico City is on the other side of Vulcan Toluca. And again, even with Javier, there's, you know, we're always talking about architecture and talking about the things we've been to. And um, for both of us, we very quickly gravitated towards Mies van der Rohe's Farnsworth House as, as this really incredible um, pavilion uh, on this pretty flat site. Obviously, completely different context, completely different site. Uh, you know, even this manicured lawn is so completely different from Javier's site in the end. And I would argue also our, where we took the project is fundamentally different than, the, than a lot of things about this project. But what we were very interested in was the spatial quality of being sandwiched between two horizontal planes and using those two planes to frame the landscape uh, on all four sides. And that became a really important sort of genesis for the project um, that then resulted in the final design that you see here, uh, obviously floor plan. Uh, and really, the, it's, it really is a cabin. It's quite small. Uh, the con the con condition space is this, um, just there. So you have two bedrooms, a small, very small bathroom. Javier's wife is still angry at me because it's too small. Um, and, uh, and then a, like a more sort of enclosed living room space when it's cold outside. And then a more open uh, living space with sliding doors that can disappear into pockets. And then also a sliding door here that disappears into the pocket. And then what you're seeing here is, I don't know if you can see it in your screen, but these are all the steel columns, which we made as thin as possible, that support the whole roof. So the whole roof is this entire condition. And that covers a recinto floor that is laid on top of a concrete slab. So the idea is that, of course, this is a solid. And then this bar is a solid. But everywhere that you see the recinto uh, tile floor, is intended to feel either feel like it's exterior here or it is exterior here. And then you can see the light wells. The light wells are situated in strategic places to bring light down uh, where we wanted to get a little bit more light uh, on the interior spaces, including an exterior one right here, which is a, was intended or the idea is that it's a courtyard space at, at the outside. So unfortunately, I was supposed to go down a month ago to shoot, to have this shot with Javier and Cesar uh, Behar, the photographer. And we had to call it off because of obvious reasons. Um, so I can show some photographs uh, of the project nearing completion. Uh, these were taken by Javier's uh, partner, Benedict. So I appreciate him letting me show these. He's actually a really good photographer. Uh, this is showing sort of arriving the, at the site uh, and you're seeing the, the pavilion, if you will, with the skylights that are steel clad. Um, and there's these sight walls that sort of lead you in. The one time on the site where you really sort of can experience this building as an object is where you can get distance between it and you because of the reservoir that had to be built on the site. Uh, basically, this site is off the grid. Um, I mean, technically it has electricity to it, but the idea is that every, they're, they're basically um, through solar and storage tanks, everything is being reused and recycled. Uh, so there is a reservoir that they first built on the site. And this is that one moment where you see the house more as sort of a pavilion in the landscape. But what I love is getting photographs like these where very quickly the landscape is just taking over you get this really wonderful, you know, brush or shrubs that are typically between four, you know, one and two meters high. So there's this 
the, the buildings really start to play hide and seek on the site in a really beautiful way. I think some of these uh, photographs actually are by Beto Kritzler. Here you're, you've arrived um, at the, this is sort of the front door, if there is a front door, um, where you've got a, um, we wanted outdoor spaces all around the entire pavilion. So this is, you step up into the west facing uh, covered patio area, which has a, a um, fireplace. And then if you turn, uh, you'll, you're presented with this uh, courtyard space with with vegetation. Again, you can walk all the way around the building and stay covered. This is the north side of the building. This is down at the east end with the idea of um, uh, a lot of discussion was about um, sort of similar to a cat in a living room sort of following the sun over the course of the day. So the idea was this is taken in the morning. Um, just a great place to have breakfast. And then stepping back into the main part of the house, this is the, the living dining space that is actually inside. So you can actually see this is the slide. Actually, this is the sliding door that's in the open position. This is also a sliding door that opens up into a pocket. What's interesting is um, Javier really, uh, when we look at the Mies van der Rohe Farnsworth house, of course, you all know it's a steel building. And early on, uh, Javier was interested in experimenting uh, in a way that he, I don't think, can typically in Mexico with wood construction. Uh, so, and there was a lot of reasons for that. I think one, it was just as an architect wanting to experiment with a new technology, not that you haven't done wood construction, but it's something we do all the time. Uh, but also wanting to, to think a little bit more about materiality and, and you know, wood as a sustainable material. Uh, and also just the sense of being lighter on the ground. Uh, so what's interesting in, in this building, it, it definitely differs from Mises building in the sense that it's a slab on grade. Um, because a lot of different reasons, it made more sense to not do just a frame building that sits on the ground, but rather to set up a platform. There are some architectural reasons uh, that we did that as well. Um, but for maintenance reasons, I didn't want to do wood columns at the per periphery of the building. Uh, and also we wanted to create the, the, the pavilion itself as light as possible. So we sort of did a hybrid of steel columns at the perimeter and then uh, did all the wood framing uh, for the walls and the roof framing. Uh, what was also interesting is because we do this all the time, we ended up deciding that we would do the majority of the construction drawings. So we did the CD set and we actually had this engineered in Seattle as well. And then the last building um, is the bathhouse. Uh, it's a funny one to talk about. Uh, I think, I don't believe Javier and I had either one of us done a circular building before. Mm -hmm. That was not the intent, uh, but it ended up being a round building with the initial obvious uh, reference study for us immediately because it was a bathhouse was Lucan's uh, Trenton bathhouse uh, in New Jersey. And actually, I thought about, I just didn't have the time, but I thought about showing our original schemes, which they don't directly copy this building, but it's pretty crazy how referential it is. We had four squares with a round pool in the middle. And um, there were a lot of reasons why we went away from that. I have yet to experience this building uh, completed. I've been there a number of times during construction. So I know how it feels. Obviously these are photo, actually these are photographs I think that we took under construction uh, where you have a circular interior space with radiating uh, beams uh, and then four spaces. 
that create four different bathing experiences. Uh, this is the changing room with the toilet and the sink. This is a steam shower. Uh, this is a thermae, like a hot bath that you actually step down into, and then a sauna. And what's, what's pretty cool about this building, I think, is that none of these interior spaces have any windows. Uh, and what we, the other interesting thing was that we, this building was designed at the same time, but always sort of slightly behind the house. And so what you're seeing actually is things from the house that started to filtrate into this building, uh, like the skylight specifically. And so once the skylight started arriving, we stopped worrying about having windows in these spaces and rather just make them spaces where you have indirect light that comes down from above. And with the, the circle, what I really appreciate is that, and again, I, I haven't been there in the final completion, but I can sense even being there during construction that what's quite nice is that you sort of lose this idea of orientation with the circle. Suddenly everything creates an equal orientation. And these apertures between the solids become ways of framing the landscape in a similar but also very different way than uh, as experienced in the house. And then in the center is the idea of a cold plunge pool that uh, with a circular colonnade of uh, very thin steel columns. Uh, so we, we joke that this is the inverted Tempietto um, uh, with a, a opening to the sky. Also, again, that's, there's so many references in some of these buildings. James Terrell's work uh, was constantly being discussed as, as well. Um, this is showing, actually, I'm not going to talk about the studio, but the studio you're seeing, here's the studio, here's the bathhouse, and then the cabin is over to the left. And this was taken maybe two months ago, so they were still completing some siding. But I just really love the vegetation that, you know, really starts taking over on the site. I think this is a photo by Beto, really nice telephoto showing the exterior siding, the radiating beams. We wanted to replicate or, or, or use a similar construction uh, technology as the cabin throughout all three buildings and sort of create relationships through tectonic. Uh, and then let the buildings differ based on their program, their, program, their spatial qualities and their proportions. But I like this photo because it shows the, the, these, these columns are two inches in diameter, super skinny. We, we pushed our engineer to make them as small as possible. And then they actually slide up on the inside of this blue lamb wood beam uh, that is a complete circle created by the contractor. And then <laughs> these are just WhatsApp photos. Here's Javier. I think that's Sebastian. Yeah, that's <laughs> uh, and, but I just love these sort of quick snapshots that they send to us. Uh, again, we haven't photographed this yet uh, professionally. By the way, we're gonna, have, we're gonna have Javier next week on the 15th and Sebastian on the 22nd. Perfect, well, here they are getting ready. Yeah, they're getting ready there. <laughs> like Sebastian's getting ready to jump in. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, these are sort of dusk photos. Um, <laughs> I like this shot partly because Javier is just hanging out, but you know, again, sort of how you, how this really, like by, by treating the, these volumes as dark, you really illuminate and frame this moment. And that was, that was really important to this building. Yeah, it, it feels kind of like the opposite on the, on the house. I forgot the name of the, the previous one you showed that, that you see all the black and the, the patio lights out with the light coming off from the yep. sky. So it's kind of the opposite way. And then during, when it rains, the idea was that all the water goes into this gutter and then it drips down into the pool with the idea that the pool would overflow mm -hmm. uh, up to this, to this line. Mm -hmm. So how am I doing time-wise? Ooh, I'm already at 42 minutes. Really quick. Um, the other thing that we spend a lot of time on, or we try to spend as much time as we can, it's it's hard to when you have when you're trying to make money to pay bills and staff, 
but we do do a lot of projects on the side that are sort of non-billable that are more ex explorations. Um, again, this started for me about 15 years ago in 2004 uh, with my partner at that time, Tom Mall, when we were presented with an opportunity to do something with a house uh, that was going to be demolished. Uh, this is an old farmhouse that we initially talked with our client about trying to salvage, but it wasn't in, it, it didn't make any sense financially or structurally to keep this house. It was also placed in a really bad location on the site and our client decided to build a new house. And literally the Friday before um, the Monday that construction was to start, uh, we realized we had a chance to do something to this house. And we, we like many architects had been influenced a lot by Gordon Matta Clark amongst many other artists who have worked at an architectural scale. Um, and we asked our client if we could do something to this house over the weekend, she said, yes. Uh, so we had, you know, we had one evening to talk about what would we do. And so we decided let's just drill the front facade full of holes, light it up at night and give people something beautiful to look at. And so we did that. Um, it took a lot of time actually, because we had to take all the plaster down and drill this facade full of holes. But we had this idea of like doing this celebration of this house and giving the neighbors this view of this uh, house on its last stand, if you will. And the reason why we, I think I continue doing this kind of work is that maybe a few things uh, are happening. One, we're, we're working on an architectural scale, but also we, we aren't given the opportunity as architects to fail, uh, meaning that we, you know, we have to meet our budgets. We can't have our buildings fall down. Uh, we have to meet our clients' requirements. And I think there is some value to doing, to being able to play and to do things uh, beyond just regular process in your office, but to be working on an architectural scale and not to be so concerned if something's going to work or not. And this is a great example of where we only were thinking about the exterior of this building, but the interior experience after we had drilled this building as experienced during the day was incredible. Like it was completely amazing. Um, and I, I sort of went away from that feeling like, wow, that, that was pretty incredible to just sort of do something and see what happens. So then when my own garage was going to be demolished for the studio that I'm in now, we did the same thing, but we changed the rules. Uh, we drilled the walls and the ceilings. Uh, and then once again, we knew what to expect this time, but again, the, once we changed the formula, we, you know, we just didn't think about this, but the light coming through these holes ends up showing up on the floor. Uh, it shows up on the walls. So some of these are holes that you're looking through. Some of them are reflections from these ceilings. And you end up in this like kaleidos kaleidoscope space. Um, I don't know what that means architecturally, but just the idea of doing something and uh, seeing what happens, I think it's just a really, really important thing for us anyway, that we keep doing. Uh, I always talk to my students about this beautiful letter that the artist Saul Lewitt wrote to his amazing artist friend, Eva Hess where he talks about the importance of just doing something and not worrying about where it's taking you. But if you do things enough times, then you'll start to understand where you're going in a direction. I think, especially at least for myself, if I'm just doing architectural work for clients, I don't know if I can always get that. And so this kind of work helps us uh, and is sort of like a feedback loop back into our architectural work. A much more recent example of this is in 2017, uh, in an installation that I did uh, in collaboration with Yasmin Vobis and Aaron Forrest, who have a really great uh, small firm out of Rhode Island. Uh, I was actually in Rome uh, and Yasmin was a fellow also with me uh, at the American Academy. And we decided to collaborate on something together. Uh, every year they do a celebration where they invite the city of Rome into the academy to allow fellows to show what they're working on in their studios. I was here for six months and Yasmin was also. And so for that event, we decided we would do an installation that would celebrate the opening. 
And we started becoming very interested in this little guard shack at the entrance to the academy. This is where the guard lets people in. And also be, we're interested in uh, Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown's learning from Las Vegas. Uh, Robert Venturi was a, a fellow at the academy in the 50s, I believe. But very specifically, this idea of the decorated shed, which hopefully as students, you have read this book, um, a very important book uh, in contemporary architectural theory. Um, and the difference between decorating a shed and a duck building. <laughs> we were very interested in decorating the shed uh, and making it more than what it was, giving it some architecture. So what we chose to do was construct a tower, a uh, very simple wood frame tower uh, and even brought in signage. I cut out each one of these letters, uh, but we constructed a, a wood frame tower that surrounded this shed in a pop textile of thread. So uh, we ended up cladding this frame with four different colors of thread that created a sort of a relationship or a, a, it alluded to the colors of the buildings that uh, surrounded it and made it this sort of beacon to, uh, to this event. And similar to many of the installation projects we've worked on, there's always this moment where you, you have these intentions. We wanted this really taut wrapper of thread. You know, we, we wrapped every single one of these pieces of thread back to the backside of the timber and stapled them all so that you wouldn't see the connection from the front and getting the spacing right was really important, getting everything taut. But then at night, it, completely changed, right? It's suddenly that because the moisture in the air and the cooler air, it actually changed the, the physical properties of this thread. And I thought really quite beautifully sort of gave it a different feeling. So, you know, during the daytime, it's like working and it's taut and it's ready to go. And then at night it lets its hair down and sort of relaxes. And, and then in the morning, it, in about 20 minutes, it suddenly sort of tightens up again. And I don't, again, I don't know exactly how we might use that in our buildings, but I think that that element of surprise is, is really important. I always like this last shot with the ducks, so. So um, I'm at 50 minutes. I could do or hey, I could do a quick Pecha Kucha that's five minutes and a five and a half minutes long. That'll be nice. You, should I do that? Yeah. Okay. Or, so do you wanna, or do you prefer to talk about the memory? Project? Well, that's what this is. So this is, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll just do this real quick. This is, uh, this is actually a Pecha Kucha presentation I gave about a year ago. Mm -hmm. And so it's about six minutes long. So I'm just gonna read it out. And each slide is about 20 seconds long. And this, this talks about the memory houses. I like, I like presenting this project because this, in 20 slides, it talks about this project conceptually. Okay. But then it, it also talks about the exhibition. The, the conceptual project became an exhibition. It became an installation. And then it might turn into a building. Okay. So there's this sort of interesting relationship between all the things that we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So here I go. Okay. So Memory Houses is a speculative project that investigates mortality and memory through the lens of architecture. It's situated on the Chesapeake Bay in Eastern Shore, Maryland. Architectural typologies such as dwelling, chapel, lighthouse, and memorial weave together a spatial narrative about loss and recollection. The project began in early 2015 when I realized how quickly dementia was taking over my father's mind. Confronted with my father's fading memory, and the distance to 3,000 miles, I decided to restart a project that he and I worked on 25 years before, the design for a small winery that was unfortunately never built. As a means to retain a conversation with my father in place of the one that I could no longer have, I decided to design a new building adjacent to the winery, a chapel and columbarium intended to hold his remains. And through the design of the chapel, 
my staff and I began to consider topics beyond architecture, such as mortality and memory. And out of this, the Memory Houses project was born. The final project consists of eight allegorical buildings connected throughout the site by a railroad, with each building serving as a character in a narrative that connects site with memory. In 2019, we were invited to design and install an exhibition of the project as part of Casa Luis Barragan's first annual series of architectural exhibitions located in Luis Barragan's small studio building directly across from his famous residence in the Tacubaya neighborhood of Mexico City. The exhibition opened to the general public during August and September of last year combined drawings, conceptual models, video and installation, which together brought the eight unbuilt memory houses to life. In the main exhibition room, axonometric drawings clarify the constructional logic of each building, which you see in the background, while ceramic slip cast sculptures developed in collaboration with Guadalajara based ceramic Asura workshop explored the formal qualities of each building, which you see in the foreground. And we actually designed that table as well, uh, constructed by Casa Barragan's carpenter. In the secondary exhibition room, we presented a film created by Mexico City based filmmaker Juan Benavides that com combined vi visualizations of each of the memory houses with documentary film footage of the site. And if you're interested in that video, it's actually on our website. The film highlighted our constant interest in defining what is real and unreal in our ongoing search for the boundaries of architecture. In a small room at the back of the studio where Luis Barragan would store drawings and models, we presented an archive of all of the conceptual models that were created for each of the memory houses. Carefully placed on the rooftop of the studio, we designed and constructed a temporary site-specific installation, a half-scale version of the unbuilt chapel that I designed for my father in 2015. Alluding to Saul Lewitt's incomplete open cubes, a prefabricated wood structure was designed to trace the minimal outline of the original chapel's pyramidal form. The wood structure was assembled on site with a crew of talented Mexican carpenters. And to complete the chapel, my staff and I clad the wood structure in clear monofilament fishing line spaced at one inches on center. Approximately four kilometers of monofilament line were threaded through eyelets up and over the top of the frame, requiring all five of my staff to install one thread at a time. The monofilament line gave the chapel a ghost-like presence, alluding to the form of the original unbuilt chapel and created an ever-changing aurora of refracted light depending on one's vantage point within or outside of the structure. And the cruciform plan and elevation embedded the chapel within the geometry of Barragon Studio while the structural cantilevers and flickering transparency of the monofilament line suspended the chapel above the rooftop. With its association to religious symbolism, the installation became an homage to Luis Barragan. Following the closure of the exhibition at Casa Barragan, the installation was dismantled. And around the same time, my close friend and frequent collaborator, Mexico City-based architect Javier Sanchez, acquired a remote site in the mountains west of Mexico City to serve as a retreat for his family. He decided that the wood frame could be relocated to his site to be reassembled and installed on foundation walls constructed of local stone. The wood frame will then be clad with horizontal beveled wood siding stained black. The resulting semi-subterranean space created between the foundation walls and the hovering pyramidal structure will serve as a private meditation space and public music performance space. Small glass tiles uh, installed in a random pattern on the walls and roof will provide a dappled light quality within the space. And frame views of the surrounding site will be created between the stone foundation walls and the hovering cantilever shroud, in particular highlighting the outline of a nearby Toluca volcano. The half scale installation originally created on the rooftop of Luis Barragan's studio will in turn be translated to a full-scale building, one that embodies a memory of an unbuilt memorial chapel originally designed for a site 3,000 miles away. 
Thank you. Beautiful. Oh, beautiful. We have some some questions. Uh, let's. John Paulette, I don't know if you're. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, okay. Uh, thank you for sharing your work. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, I have a question about uh, these small models you make, and um, in what phase uh, do you share these uh, iterations to, with your client? Uh, is, is, is it a, an important tool to communicate to your clients the models or not? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, yeah, it's very important. Um, it's, it's important for us as a process, um, uh, but it's also definitely a, a important um, presentation tool, particularly at the beginning. We don't do many um, sort of presentation models, if you will. Um, almost all of our models typically are just very crude working models, but we find that they're just great tools to, to engage our client. And still, I mean, of course we use Rhino, we use 3D tools and things like that. But especially at the beginning, showing them five different versions of what something could be, uh, as long as we're excited about all five, uh, it's, it's a good tool to, to really engage them. And there's just something different about being able to pick something up and look into it versus like controlling the views in a Rhino model. So it's still very important to us for our process, but also for, for our clients. Have you approached like a bigger scale model or just still try to do like small, a small one because of uh, being fast with the iterations or something? Um, definitely efficiency is important. So, um, you know, along with our, um, because we don't have super high end projects, we don't have fees that allow us to maybe do, you know, lots and lots of time on certain models. So the model building is really important to us, but it, what's equally important is to, to think of them as sketches and think of them as rapid conditions. So no, typically we actually don't do a larger scale model. Um, I mean, if we had, for the right project and depending on the complexity of something, we have done some larger scale sort of wall section related models, but typically once we're at that scale, we're working in, in two dimensional sort of more conventional uh, wall section mode to try to understand assemblies and spatial sectional relationships. Okay, thank you. Thank you. What time is it? How are we doing the time? I think we're almost done. I, if there's any other question there out there, uh, if they raise their hand, let me see. I don't see any more there. Okay. We, there is one? Hold on. Uh, so I would like to, uh, I think we run out of time, uh, but we're going to uh, wrap this up uh, by telling you uh, that even though you divide the the, the work that you have in your office, and then you talk about these explorations as a, as a, as what it, it inspires you to 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 go more deeply into thinking about architecture. I really see that on your day to day work, you have that exploration. So so, I just want to congratulate you on your work. It's amazing. The, the I can see the I I, I have imprinted in my mind. Uh, like the, the light that came in into the space where the the courtyard house is, that everything was green and then everything black and then again green on the inside. That those are the memories that 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 architecture should should express into people. And in the tiny house also, uh, the 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 way it's you minimize the circulation as as, as a four by four feet, even less, maybe three by three feet, is the circulation on the lower level that you go up and then you go to the right, you go to the left. Those things, when you run out of space, it, it becomes, uh, it, it, it seems like it's a technical aspect, but it, it's, it's not, not really just technical. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the way you lower the, the height of the windows to, to be able to have a surprise when you get in and see the, 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 the double height walls, and then, and then you, with that, that in mind, you forget 
about the other areas that are seven foot or, or not to forget, but the most important is the two, two double height ceiling. So, so th that's, those are the experiences that, that are imprinted in the minds of the people that live architecture. So that, that'll be my, my, the way I, I saw your presentation. And I would like to thank you very much thank for you. taking the time to talk with our students and, and the people that is from, that is not our student, that I see several faces there that I don't know. <laughs> but thanks everybody for being a part of this. There is, there is one question. I think, oh no, they put a, a clap. I think that's Juan Benavides. I think he does have a question. Oh yeah, let's 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 give him Juan. What's your question? I mean, I <laughs> I've been listening this whole time. It's it's amazing this sort of setup of a collective room. <laughs> um, I did have a question. Um, I don't know if I can, Jorge. Yes, Very quick. <laughs> well, so basically, I'm sort of extending uh, Jorge's comment. I don't know why I have a virtual background in here. Wait a little. Oh, yeah. It's better. Um, just to extend on Jorge's comment, because I think, I mean, in a way, what I find fascinating on your work is that you sort of understand there's a balance in between projects that feed you economically and projects that feed your soul, which are these sort of personal explorations that sort of can go any way. It could be an installation on a near to be demolished building. It could be in a series of drawings. It could be in a series of conversations. It can be in you teaching at UDOF. Um, so I think what it's what is fascinating is that you sort of find ways to keep feeding your curiosity. Um, you listen to music all the time. You know, you drive a motorcycle, which becomes all part of this sort of lifestyle that you like to carry. That's just image. Huh? <laughs> that's just my, that's just for image. Maybe it's image, maybe it's only image. Uh, so I don't know, like how, how do you, how do you feed your curiosity? Because you can really tell in your work those sort of details that appear are just sort of ways of seeing that you have uh, developed over the years. Right. No, I think it's a good, I mean, Juan knows, knows me well and, and he and I collaborated on, on some things other than just video. So we share some similar, I think, outlooks as well. But it's it, when I started this practice in 2013, it was definitely with the idea of trying to be able to give myself as many opportunities as I could to, to allow me to try to push what practice means uh, because I, I realized that if I'm just don't get me wrong I mean I love in the end it's it's about architecture so of course architecture is built work and 80 percent of what we do if not more is trying to build work but um, at least for myself if I'm just doing that I'm not getting I'm, it's not giving me enough places to explore um, that's just partly the the way we're set up and, and maybe there's other practices out there that can get the exploration that they need because they have a different type of client and a different type of workplace and whatever so it's not trying to say good or bad it's just that's what i realized that and again it was it's was coming out of me starting to do things like the installation projects and realizing i was getting stuff out of these other things that I just wasn't getting out of my built work. And then I realized also that it, it was a feedback loop that allowed me to keep moving and being and staying excited about the built work, which is really important. So it's it's more just for myself anyway, and, and what I would what I'm always encouraging my students is to just seek out what you're excited about and pursue it. Um, and it's easy to it's easier said than done when you're trying to run an office and trying to still make money, I'm not going to say that's an easy place to go, but if you're getting something out of it, that's not just monetary, that can be a good thing. Good. Okay. Well, it's very inspiring. Um, it, I always like to thank you very much. I think we're not run out of time right now. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and we we'll look looking forward to invite you to the school. I, I, I love promise. It. 
and and I will I will bring you to the school. So so yeah. I would love that. Yeah. And Never we'll, been to Tijuana. We'll go riding to Valle Guadalupe. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for the invitation. It was fun. Thanks everybody for participating in this. Okay. Thank you very much. There was another question, but yeah. Bye. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. Thank you.